before we move on to the discussion on timing error detectors always refer to this figure which is a seesaw near my home timing synchronization is always about balancing the seesaw so if one side goes down and one is up we need to bring this one down so that they again come to a balance start with a derivative ted timing error detector we already know that the derivative is the slope of a curve at a point so when the slope reaches zero it's either a maximum or a minimum value so to maximize the correlation we take the derivative of z square if we take the derivative we get 2z into z dot 2 is a constant can be easily ignored and we get z into z dot the match filter output and the derivative of the match filter output as opposed to the derivative of the match filter output in frequency domain which we saw in the case of carrier frequency synchronization here we are taking a derivative in time domain first we see why this approach works this is an eye diagram which is just a pulse amplitude modulation symbols overlap with each other and we can see that the slope is positive in this case and the data symbols is also positive when you multiply these two a positive value implies we need to take our timing estimate ahead however if the data symbol is negative the slope is also negative the product of these two indicates again that we should move forward similarly here the slope is negative which means z dot is negative but the data symbol is positive so the product of these two is negative which tells us to come back finally here the slope is positive but the data symbol is negative and the product of these two indicates us to come back this is how a timing lock loop is driven this is the block diagram of a derivative ted we have an analog to digital converter that is taking l samples per symbol we have a match filter that is a pulse shape a root raised cosine pulse shape for example and the timing match filter which is the derivative of this pulse shape just like we did in carrier frequency synchronization case we have pre computed the derivative of this pulse shape and put it here after match filtering and timing match filter we have interpolator and interpolator control this is the timing error detector so it's um, the same approach but in a decision directed manner we make we take the sign to make it a hat rest this is the timing lock loop having a separate filter with this operation is a little complicated so we want to compute the derivative through an even simpler operation we sample the match filter output at two samples per symbol and take the derivative from the two neighboring samples so match filter output the next neighboring sample and the previous neighboring sample their difference gives the slope and this is the match filter output it is the same strategy as this one you can say that an early late ted is just an approximation of a derivative ted by early late we mean the early sample and the late sample there are other forms of early late tets as well remember that everything started with taking the squared match filter output so if we want to take a derivative we just take some suitable value and we take the late early sample and we take the late sample and we subtract these two to get the slope this is called the square law ted similarly the absolute value ted takes the same match filter output values but with the absolute values and they work because squaring or taking absolute value removes the effect of modulation itself automatically when we take this difference if this slope is positive we know that we are sampling early when this slope is negative we know that the we are sampling late and we, here we are sampling almost on time these curves they represent match filter output squared in which squaring has removed the effect of the modulation symbol in these cases there was no squaring so we need to multiply with match filter output to remove the effect of the data symbol before we discuss zero crossing timing error detector we will have a quick review of what we have achieved so far the approach we have discussed in derivative ted and early late ted is called symbol centric approach because we are taking the derivative of the energy which is 
z square and comes out to be 2 z into z dot. So we are finding the peak of this pulse. For this purpose, we are deriving this towards 0. When the derivative is 0, we have reached the maximum. Another approach is that we can drive this term towards 0. Why? Because the final purpose is to have an error signal that goes towards 0. Not necessarily that the derivative needs to go to 0. Either this term or this term. If any of them goes to 0, the final error signal is approaching 0 and we say that the timing lock loop has locked. It turns out that if we use the same samples with a negative sign of derivative, which means that we were taking the derivative in early late case from these two samples, this minus this. If we take a negative sign, it implies that we are taking a derivative as this minus this. When we do that, interestingly, this term goes towards 0 and we have an, uh, zero, a timing error detector which is given by this expression. This is a non detected version and known as Gardner TED and it's by far the most popular timing error detector in the timing synchronization references. So here you can see that the expression is, looks very similar to a match filter output multiply by a derivative. In this case, a difference of two terms. So again, this TED works at two samples per symbol. And the main thing to notice is that ZM minus one, this is the previous sample. ZMTM, this is the future sample. So we are, that's why we can see a negative sign here. So we are subtracting a future sample from a previous sample as opposed to the early late TED where we were subtracting a past sample from the future sample. That's an early late. So this could have been late early. One difference here is that in the case of early late TED, we had the match filter output and then the two neighboring samples. When we apply an approach like this, we have the middle sample that approaches 0 and then we have two symbols, zm minus 1 tm minus zm tm. That is why if you have seen the data edit version of Gardner TED, which is called the zero crossing TED, it is given by match filter output zm minus m by tm by 2 into am minus 1 minus am. So the previous symbol minus the current symbol. One approach to estimate the symbol timing in a joint operation with the carrier frequency offset is the band dash timing error detector. We have already discussed band dash detectors in the case of a frequency lock loop. Let us see how this works. As a review, the, we had the two filters which are half cycle of a sign, half cycle of a sign, which is called an even band dash filter, and half cycle of a sign, negative half cycle of a sign, and this is called an odd band dash filter we obtained an error signal for CFO correction as the output of the even bandage filter multiplied with the conjugate of the output of the odd bandage filter. The in phase part of this product drove the frequency lock loop. Now we will see that the Q part of the same product can be used to drive the timing lock loop. Let us discuss the case of zero CFO first. The error signal is given by the product of even and output bandage filters conjugate. The input signal arrives right at the center of the spectrum because there is no CFO present. Therefore, the output from the upper bandage filter is exactly the same as the output from the lower bandage filter. In this case, here they are also the same but with a negative sign. Now we also know that the multiplication in time domain is convolution in frequency domain. When we convolve the output of even bandage filter, we need to convolve it with the output of the odd bandage filter in frequency domain. We get something like this. And recall that they are very similar to two impulses in frequency domain. One here and one here, which is a sinusoid, a sign shape in time domain. As far as a non-zero CFO case is concerned, the input signal arrives a little bit towards the left for a negative CFO. So we have a larger output from the lower bandage filter and a smaller output from the upper bandage filter. A similar case we can see here. When the convolution frequency domain happens, we get two similar 
sort of impulses at the symbol rate. Convolution is one spectrum rolling over another. When it reaches right at the middle, then we, we have captured this moment here. And we see that the output is area under this product curve of this product minus the area under this, which is the energy difference between the two outputs and given by this spectrum. And this is an indicator of a CFO. Let us take an example. Here we have a band edge filter with excess bandwidth alpha equal 0.25 and L is equal to 4 samples per symbol. The I part is drawn in the above diagram and the Q part in the lower diagram. Here you can see that we have an impulse corresponding to the amount of CFO present and two impulses at the symbol rate. Therefore, we can see that we can drive both the frequency lock loop and the timing lock loop by the I and Q components respectively. The main thing to notice here is that much of the self noise in these regions here and in this region here has been eliminated. The question is where is the timing offset? Since we have the symbol at sinusoid here, we have already covered this concept that the phase of this signal gives us the timing offset in time domain. So as far as the summary of band dash timing error detector is concerned, we can say that this product is very similar to squaring a signal. With the only difference is that much of the irrelevant spectrum out of the mesh filter output has been filtered out here and this filters out much of the spectrum is irrelevant to the timing signal. Otherwise, the concept is very similar to squaring a signal. Here's a block diagram for a band edge timing and frequency error detector. We can see that the output from the upper and lower band edge filters is added together to form the E1 output. They are subtracted together to form the odd output and then the conjugate is multiplied with the other. The Q part drives the timing lock loop and the I part drives the frequency lock loop. In lecture 6, we discussed the intuition behind band edge frequency error detector where we used the energy difference between the two band edge filter outputs as the error signal driving the frequency lock loop. Here we take the actual route of forming an even and odd band edge filter and driving both the frequency and timing lock loop. Let us see how. The excess bandwidth is defined as 0.5. The samples per symbol are 16 and the timing and frequency offset are defined through a slider each. One thing I want you to notice is that the timing offset here does not mean the timing phase offset. Here, this is the timing clock frequency offset or which is called sampling clock frequency offset. That's why it goes from 0.9 to 1.1 and the ideal value is 1.0. The sample rate is 32,000 while the carrier frequency is 6,000. These are the complex coefficients for the lower and upper band edge filters which were designed offline and, and the values were entered here. I have chosen the same terminology as GGN and GGP as negative and positive band edge filters here so that to be consistent with what is out there in other resources. Anyone who is willing to delve deeper into the concept of band edge filter can immediately connect to what we have here. Let's see what the flow graph is doing. After the pitch generation, we have the custom QAM waveform block where the carrier frequency of offset is introduced in here. The excess bandwidth and the other parameters are taken from these variables. This is the local oscillator I and Q waveforms, which are which down converts the incoming QAM signal. I've converted it to a complex waveform so that the rest of the processing can be simplified. This is the channel model block, which is used here to introduce the timing offset. Again, this is the sampling clock frequency offset, not timing phase offset. The output of this block is given to two band edge filters, the negative band edge filter and the positive band edge filter, or the lower band edge filter and the upper band edge filter. As opposed to what we did in the frequency synchronization case, where we were just focusing on the frequency error detector, here we are utilizing the output of the lower and upper band edge filters to produce two error signals. One is the frequency error detector and the other is the timing error detector. So we subtract the output of the upper band edge filter from the lower band edge filter which 
basically forms the odd bandage filter output and here we are adding their values which forms the output of the even bandage filter then they are multiplied the conjugate of one is multiplied with the other the real part is the frequency error detector the imaginary part is the timing error detector and here we are looking at the error signals in time the frequency error detector spectrum and the timing error detector spectrum the last part of the flow graph is a simple frequency sync which shows the down converted signal spectrum as well as the spectral responses of the negative and positive or lower and upper band edge filters i introduced the gaussian noise source here because the gaussian noise has a flat power spectral density and a constant multiplied with some particular shape and generates an output that same shape in this way we are able to see the spectral responses of any kind of filters through the frequency sync let us run this flow graph now and generate its output we can see the frequency offset and the timing offset that can be controlled through these sliders the error signals both the frequency error detector output and the timing error detector output are shown in this time sync while these four frequency syncs show the down converted spectrum the band edge spectra frequency error detector spectrum and the timing error detector spectrum respectively starting from this we can see that there is a sinusoid that can be observed its amplitude is modulated by some waveform but nevertheless it is a sinusoidal waveform coming to here we can see that this is the down converted spectrum shown in blue and the other two spectra correspond to the band edge filters the lower band edge filter and the upper band edge filter or the negative and positive band edge filters the output of these spectra are shown here and we can see the equal power out of these two due to the frequency offset being zero therefore the frequency error detector spectrum shows nothing and the timing error detector spectrum because of the generation of a simple red sinusoid shows two spectral impulses at 2 kilohertz if we go back we see that the sample rate is 32000 and there are 16 samples per symbol so the symbol rate is given by samples per second divided by samples per symbol which is 2 kilohertz now let us start by changing the frequency offset a frequency offset of 100 hertz is introduced and which you can see that the output is not zero anymore the fed output the frequency detector output is not zero any more the second thing you see here is that the receive spectrum has shifted slightly to the right and therefore the power output of the two band edge spectra has a non zero differential in the spectrum we can see a dc value which corresponds to the frequency error detector and the third spectrum still shows two spectral impulses if we keep increasing the frequency one thing you will notice here is that the third output is being modulated by the frequency error detector output this is more visible for a lower value you can clearly see that the third output is being modulated by the frequency error detector output the, when the frequency error detector output is large there is a large modulation on the third signal sinusoid and when this error is small it is the other way around so for large swings we can observe a swing in the third output as well let's start it again and come back here here you can see that the most of the spectrum has shifted to the right due to 500 hertz frequency offset there is very little output that comes out of the lower band edge filter thus differential has become very large and this is why we can see a spike in the frequency error detector output and the third spectrum actually has gone lower focus on this spectrum and see that
with an increasing frequency offset the power of the third spectrum goes down and then after a few more such operations the power out of the negative or lower bandage filter completely goes away as well as the third spectrum output we have a very strong frequency error detector signal but nothing from here let's go back to a zero frequency offset and let's change the timing offset you can see the timing offset does not change the positions of the band aspect as expected closely observe this region for a while and you will see that while the actual amplitude goes up and down but the peaks are always at the same place the peaks of these sinusoids as well as the zero crossing of these sinusoids are occurring at the same place at the same time now if i introduce a timing offset and you clearly observe here then both the peaks and the zero crossings they are changing their position this is what happens in a real system where the transmit clock is different than the receive clock and the receive clock has to continuously track the transmit clock and these zero crossings they can be tracked for successful sampling of the received signal at the or maximum opening of the eye diagram you can see these peaks shifting around the actual amplitude is being modulated by the frequency error detector output but the peaks are moving and as soon as i make it one you will see that the peaks are again occurring at the same point and then introduce the frequency offset in parallel so you can play around with these this is a very beautiful demonstration of what signal processing can do it's just a mere play with numbers out of a qam waveform but here we have a frequency error detector signal and a timing error detector signal through which we can acquire both the carrier and the timing